morning. How are you this morning? Good. Just, just over 11 years ago, my wife and I began planning our wedding. And I say my wife and I, but in truth, mainly my wife. This is because, like most men, I felt that after the proposal, my part was really pretty much over, right? <laughs> the majority of the work I had to do was done. Uh, after all, let's be honest, I bought the ring, I planned the proposal, and I got down on one knee and asked the all-important question. So I felt reasonably sure, once she said yes, my part of the work was largely done. Now don't misunderstand me, I was not opposed to helping out or participating. For example, when she asked me to, to help uh, pick out a flavor for the wedding cake, I painstakingly spent an entire afternoon at a bakery weighing every possible option, because even though my work was done, I'm a team player. But I, a little further into the, the wedding planning process, I made a tactical mistake. I made a mistake no seasoned husband would ever make. I was asked about my preference, or about a, a, a preference for the color of the napkins at the, at the reception dinner after the, the wedding. And I responded with, I don't care. <laughs> now here's the thing, I see a lot of married men nodding. Some of you unmarried men, it's not immediately apparent what's wrong with this answer. So allow me to explain. See, especially, it, you, it's, easily, it's easy to get confused because what's wrong with saying I don't care when you really, in fact, don't care? Here's, here's the problem. <laughs> You could have said, I'm not sure. You could have said, gosh, babe, that is a great question. They both look incredible. I'm kind of going back and forth. What do you prefer? You could have said any number of things that demonstrate you're an active participant in planning this wedding and that you're taking this marriage seriously. But when you respond with, I don't care, you were subtly and unconsciously implying you also don't care very much about the marriage itself. And that something that matters very much to your future spouse does not matter that much to you. And this is a problem because your response is going to be seen as a reflection of how you really feel. And this I began to learn 11 years ago. And I'm still learning, but I've made some, some progress. Now, I'm being, I'm being admittedly sarcastic, but deep down, we all know that our responses to things are important, not just in, in wedding planning, but, but in life as well. Because much of being a, a good parent or, or a, good, a good student, a good teacher, a, a good spouse, or, or even a good employer or employee is about knowing the appropriate response in different situations, knowing the correct response and why. In fact, the well-known pastor Chuck Swindoll once said that life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond to it, which I think most of us would probably agree with, if only on the basis of our own life experience. Because whether it be responding to our fiancé regarding wedding plans or, or, or our boss at work or, or unexpected life circumstances, our responses tend to shape our reality. But this is also true spiritually. Because responding to God, how we respond to God as revealed in Jesus Christ is undeniably the most important response you or I will ever make. One which will absolutely shape not just our reality, but the very direction of our lives. And I think this is why most of us here today have made some sort of a response to Christ, even if we don't realize it. Whether positive or negative, each one of us probably has some idea about what the, the birth, life, and death of Jesus means. And those beliefs, plus our response to them, form the basis of our response to Christ. We all pretty much have one, and we all pretty much think Ours is the correct one. However, this morning as we continue our, our Advent series, we come to a, a selection of Scripture which I believe 
might make us pause and wonder if our response to Christ is correct. Might make us question whether or not our response to Christ's arrival is actually the appropriate one, even if we're longtime church members. Because what we're going to see is that according to Luke, the author of the third gospel, there is essentially one appropriate response to Christ's arrival. One thing that Luke thinks should define our lives in response to Jesus. And this morning we're going to consider what that response is and why it is so important. So if you have a Bible with you this morning, would you turn to Luke chapter 1 as we consider Christmas according to Luke. Now, as many of you might remember from our, our series in Acts earlier this fall, Luke is actually the author of the majority of the New Testament. Even though he, he only wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, those two books are lengthy enough that it actually makes him the most prolific author in the New Testament. But aside from this, there's only a few things we, we actually know from Scripture about who Luke was. Now one, for example, we know that, that Luke is a, a companion of Paul. Luke is a close friend of Paul. He even joins Paul on a, on a number of, of Paul's missionary journeys or, or portions of those missionary journeys. Second, we know that Luke is a Gentile. He is, he is not a Jew. And that he is also a physician, a, a doctor of some sort. And finally, we know that Luke's books, both of them, kind of a part one and a part two, are composed, written to a specific man named Theophilus the purpose of which Luke's, Luke makes clear in the opening verses of his gospel, where he writes, So, it seemed good to me, since I have carefully investigated everything from the very first, to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. Thus, we have some idea from Luke's own hand or from Luke's own mouth, so to speak, of what Luke is trying to do in his gospel and in Acts. He's trying, he's doing his best to describe accurately the things Jesus did and said. He's doing his best to provide a, a reliable, historical account. And having this goal in mind, Luke chooses to begin his gospel, the book devoted to the story of Jesus, he begins it, with the appearance of the angel Gabriel to the man Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. And then the appearance of Gabriel to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And from there, Luke weaves together the beautiful story of Jesus' arrival. The virgin conception. The travel to Bethlehem. The birth in a, in a stable. And finally, the, the proclamation, the angel's proclamation to the lonely shepherds. All the scenes of Christmas we have grown to know and love. But in our appreciation for Luke's story, we might be prone to miss the subtle thread which connects every single character in Luke's nativity story. The one thing they all seemingly share. Specifically, their response to Christ's arrival. Let's begin, for example, with Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, the one sent by God to, to prepare the people of Israel for the coming of Jesus. When the angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah and tells him candidly what these miraculous events, the miraculous conception of his son, will mean, he tells Zechariah plainly, there will be joy and delight for you, and many will rejoice at his birth. Now, of course, the angel's speaking about the birth of John the Baptist, but make a mental note of what the angel says Zechariah and others will feel regarding these events. They will experience joy, delight, and they will rejoice. But they aren't the only ones, it turns out. If you have your Bible open, skip down 30, 30 more verses where we find Mary, the mother of Christ, going to visit Elizabeth the wife of Zechariah, the, the mother of John. And upon her arrival, though they are both still unborn, though, though Jesus and John are both still unborn, John responds to Jesus' coming. Elizabeth tells Mary, for you see 
when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped for joy inside me. Even though he has yet to take his first breath, John knows exactly what Christ's arrival means. And so does Mary, who in response to what Elizabeth has says, responds, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. So she too is filled with joy at the imminent fulfillment of God's promises. But the list of those who respond in joy to the events of Christmas only continues to grow. Because 10 verses later, Luke tells us that when Elizabeth had given birth to John, then her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had shown her His great mercy and they rejoiced with her. And just a handful of verses after that, at the birth of Christ Himself, an angel appears to the shepherds tending their sheep and says, don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Are we sensing a little bit of a pattern here yet? Thus, virtually every character in the Christmas story, according to Luke, responds the exact same way to the events unfolding around them. They respond with joy. They respond with, with rejoicing, nearly every single one of them. And ironically, the, the characters that, that we typically, wrongly, depict in nativity scenes that Luke doesn't mention, the wise men, you started to laugh because you knew the answer. They also respond with joy, though we have to turn to Matthew 2.10 where we find when they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Now, what this means, I think, is that for us, we have a pretty compelling case that at least for Luke, at least for Luke, the single most appropriate response to Christ's arrival is joy. In other words, he's showing us what the appropriate response looks like by repeatedly describing it for us in the faces and in the response of every single character. And though we don't have time to read through his, his entire gospel this morning, if we did, we would notice quickly that this is a theme he continues, that he builds upon throughout the entire gospel and Acts. In fact, in, in, in Luke and Acts combined, the word joy or rejoice appears 31 times. Consequently, we can be sure that when Luke thinks of Jesus and what Jesus' arrival means, what his life means, the first thing that comes to mind for Luke is joy. And I think maybe on the surface of it, maybe initially, this might make sense to us. Right? I mean, maybe we're tempted to agree with Luke. We should we should respond with joy to Christ's arrival. But even so, I wonder how many of us would honestly say that we live a life of joy because of what Jesus has done. How many of us would say we have a deep, unshakable joy that resides in our heart because of who Christ is? And I only ask this, being brutally honest, because as I read these passages this week, and as I studied these passages this week, I felt personally a little bit convicted. Because even though I would consider myself a, a fairly positive person, I don't think joyful would be one of the first words I use to describe myself, if I'm honest. I don't think joy is one of the first things that come to mind if I think this is sort of the inner workings of my heart and my mind are marked by joy. I don't think that's necessarily true. Even in light of what Jesus has done for me. And yet in Scripture, being joyful is communicated as an obligation, as something we must do. Paul says in Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Which is pretty clear if you think about it. And it means we could safely say that being joyful is a moral obligation for us as Christ's followers. In other words, when we fail to be joyful, it's actually sinful. Because the lack of joy is, in a certain way, a manifestation of our sinful nature. 
But all this, I think, would very understandably lead us to ask the question, why? Why is joy so significant in the life of a Christian? Why does Luke seem to think that it's one of the only appropriate responses to Christ's arrival? With the remainder of our time this morning, I'd like to very briefly give you three reasons why. Three reasons why joy is the right response to Christmas. First, because joy anticipates what God will do. Joy anticipates what God will do. If you still have your Bible open in front of you, notice how in, in Luke 1.14 when speaking to Zechariah and in Luke 2.10 when speaking to the shepherds, the angel describes the joy Christ's arrival will bring. It's joy in a, in a future tense. It's joy in what's coming. It's reflective of a mind that is looking forward to the fulfillment of God's promises. Rejoicing because of what God will do. This joy comes from trusting in the promises of God even when those promises aren't completely fulfilled yet. Even when we're still waiting to see their fulfillment in the first place. Ironically, one of the best places we see this described in Scripture is actually in the life of Jesus Himself. who models perfectly for us what this sort of faith looks like. Hebrews chapter 12 writes this, read, we read like this, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before Him, He endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Notice here how the author of Hebrews says that it was for the joy set before Him that Jesus endured the shame of the cross. Which at first glance, at sort of, at sort of first blush, this seems crazy. This seems impossible. Who would use joy and, and crucifixion in the same sentence? How could we ever describe being brutally nailed to a cross and left to die as, as something joyful? Some of you are shaking your heads because you know that's not what the author of Hebrews is actually saying. He's not saying that the cross by itself was a joyful thing for Jesus to endure. Rather, he's saying that the joy came from what God would do through the cross. What God would do in spite of the pain and the shame of the cross. Thus, at His death, Jesus looked down on, despised the pain of the cross because He looked forward to the joy of what God would do through it. And in our own way, we can do a similar sort of thing. We too can rejoice at what God is doing in spite of our circumstances, even if our circumstances aren't good. But the challenge of this the reason this is sometimes difficult is because in our life, we often confuse joy and happiness. We confuse the two. We confuse the two. Um, <clears throat> we, think of, we think of our circumstances as the thing that determines whether or not we are joyful. So when life gets hard, our joy evaporates. When life gets difficult, our joy disappears. But this isn't how the Bible describes joy. Not at all. In Scripture, happiness is an emotion. Joy is a state of being. It's a deeper thing. A thing which is not a result of our circumstances, which is completely separate from what might be going on around us in the world. Rather, joy in Scripture is a result of faith. The result of faith that in God and, and even more specifically, the presence of God. Consequently, it's not dependent upon what's going on around us. So we can have joy even when the circumstances of our life are not where we would like them to be. Even when the circumstances of the world at large are not where we would like them to be. Because we believe the same God who took on flesh was born in a manger 2,000 years ago will return. And His return will, will set all things to rights. We believe that one day every sad thing will be untrue. This is what the psalmist describes in Psalm 96 when he says, let the heavens be glad 
and the earth rejoice. Let the sea and all that fills it resound. Let the fields and everything in them celebrate. Then all the trees of the forest will shout for joy before the Lord. For He is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with His faithfulness. In Scripture, God's judgment means God setting things right. God returning things, restoring things to how they were supposed to be. And so the psalmist looks forward to that day and says, celebrate because it's coming. So the first reason joy is the right response to Christmas is because it anticipates what God has begun to do through Jesus and what God will continue to do through Jesus. But secondly, because joy celebrates what God has done. Joy also celebrates what God has done. It looks not only to the future, but it also acknowledges what God has already done. We see this most clearly in the, in the, in the response of, of Elizabeth and John. When John leaps for joy at Mary's arrival and, and Elizabeth rejoices at the, at the mercy God has shown her, both are responses to what God has already done. And the reactions which are examples for us about how we should properly understand and, and celebrate Christ's arrival. Because Christ's coming means joy in a deeper and more permanent sense than anything we have ever experienced on this earth. Just over 13 years ago, on November 1st, 2010, the San Francisco Giants won their first World Series since 1954. <laughs> Hold the applause, please. <laughs> and I was overjoyed. For that moment, in the moment that that last out was recorded, and for about an hour afterward, my joy was complete. I, I had a joy in my heart that I would have sworn to you would never leave. Everything in the world was right because the Giants had won the World Series. And I understand this might not have been the case for you, and I'm very sorry. But <laughs> even if it's not, think back then, right now, fine, maybe it's not November 10th, 20, 2010. Think back to that time or a moment in your life when something happened that sparked an incredible amount of joy in your heart. Something that happened that Almost nothing else mattered after that. Maybe it was the, the birth of a, of a child or the, the sight of your, your spouse on your wedding day. Those would both be better answers than the Giants winning the World Series. <laughs> but go back to that. It was joy like you had never experienced before. Joy like you thought would never leave. It would, your life would never be the same. But in time... The truth is that the joy of that moment faded. Not in the sense that, that it wasn't a happy, not in the sense you no longer loved that person or that that didn't continue to be an incredible memory that you looked back on that memory with joy. But the sharpness, the potency of that joy began to fade. Because life set in. Life went back to normal. Reality returned. And the, the joy you had in that moment became more of a memory than a, than a sharp experience. Just like all earthly joys do. Just like all joy does. Unless it is joy built on the person in the presence of Jesus Christ. Who when speaking to his disciples about his love for them in John 15 said, I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Your joy may be full permanent, no longer a distant memory. In other words, the joy we find in Christ is not like the joy we experience in the world. The joy we find in Christ never fades. Thus, joy anticipates what God will do, celebrates what God has done, and finally, joy perceives what God is doing. Joy perceives what God is doing even in the midst of our present circumstances. One of the most beautiful songs in all of Scripture is the song that, that Mary responds with, opening with the, the words that we've, we've already read this morning. Where Mary, the mother of Christ, says, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. 
But even as we appreciate her words, we can't lose sight of the reality of this girl's situation. Because this is a young girl. A young girl who was not planning on on being pregnant. A young girl who was not prepared to deal with the the scorn of her family and friends at, at being pregnant out of wedlock. A young girl who would be very understandably, could be very understandably terrified over what life might be bringing to her in the future. And yet, in spite of all this, we find a young girl rejoicing because she perceives what God is doing. She sees what God is doing, which I think in the end might be the the greatest lesson for us today. Because I think there, there are moments where every one of us in here would admit we are not joyful. There are seasons and times in life where, when we don't feel joy. When, we, when, when the prospect of joy seems like a, a pipe dream, a distant pipe dream at best. And we wonder, how can, I, how can I really be joyful in the midst of what's going on? How can I be joyful when my life still still looks the way it does? When my life is still so far from where I wanted it to be, where I thought it would be? And the truth is, those are all valid questions. But Christmas points us towards the answer. It points us towards the answer because in Scripture, joy is always found in the presence of God. Every time. Joy is always found in the presence of God. The psalmist says in Psalm 16, 11, praise, Lord, in your presence, there is abundant joy. Acknowledges that the joy we seek is not found in any earthly pleasure. It's found only in the presence of God. Which if we think about it, lends a whole new meaning to the words of the angel Gabriel to Mary. When he says, see, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Therefore, the single most appropriate response to Christmas is joy because it means God with us. Precisely because on Christmas, God became human. He dwelt with us. Literally in the words of of the opening verses of John's Gospel, He pitched His tent and dwelt next to us. He set up camp next door. Which means suddenly, unexpectedly, we have access to God. Which means we have access to indescribable joy. Thus the solution for us The solution for us is to seek the presence of God. Seek the presence of God by going before Him in prayer. By listening to His his Word in His his Scripture. By experiencing Him through the fellowship of of His people. By knowing Him through the incarnation of His Son and the indwelling of His Holy Spirit. Because only then will we find the joy which we so desperately seek. And only then will our joy be complete. Would you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You and we praise You for the joy the arrival of Your Son brings. Forgive us, Lord, for all the countless other places that we seek to find joy. Lord, I pray that Your Spirit would fill us, give us eyes to see just how counterfeit those things are. Those things will never satisfy. We'll never find joy that lasts in anything but Your presence alone. Something which is possible for us precisely because of the birth of Your Son. We couldn't go to You So you came to us. You took on flesh. You dwelt with us. So now we have access to you. And we have access to the joy that you bring. Lord, would you fill us with your presence. 
Fill us with your joy. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen.